This is a pod. A pod about dogs. Hey, it's Sophie and Ian. Welcome to the Healthy Dog Pod. <laughs> Today we're going to be talking about socialization. Something that everybody gets told they need to do with their dog, but not really much education around on how to do it and what's involved. I think a lot of miseducation out there about just letting your dog run off and play and all of a sudden your dog will be social. Um, we think there's a lot more to it than that. When Definitely. Yeah. I mean, if we just let kids run around and play, I mean, they'd be good fun, but um, probably a bit of an idiot. Um. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, well, why don't we start with the definition? Yeah, give us it. Um, so This social- is the definition of socialization. Yeah. So, building a tolerance of others in your personal space. That's is, it. Yeah. Nothing to do with play. And I think that's where a lot of people are um, misinformed, uneducated on about socialization is play. And that's yeah. it. But there is so much more to it than just play. Yeah. I think a lot of people go into it with, uh, you know, dogs should be friendly and they should. Uh, as in, like, if we're going to put them in a social environment, we're going to make sure that they can tolerate it, though. Um, and then they will be friendly. And that building tolerance of others in your personal space is what allows them to feel comfortable enough to drop their guard and relax and be social. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think throwing. I think a lot of people just go, hey, I've got a puppy, he's innocent. I'm going to throw him in the deep end and, you know, let him go and interact and be social. And that's uh, that's all well and good if you know the individual that you're introducing him to. But um, if it's a bunch of strangers, that's an absolute lottery. So when we're socialing, socializing a dog, I think we should be quite careful with the individuals we introduce them to. Yeah, definitely. And that's pretty much what dog parks are, though. They are a bunch of strangers and strange <laughs> dogs standing in a dog park in a field. That's it. A bunch of weirdos stood in the field, kind of just don't know why they're there. Dog parks are completely unnatural things. Um, they are man-made things yeah. where we take our dogs to to let them uh, sniff, roam, play, be a dog. But um, we, if we look at our dog's body language in those parks, you'll see dogs fixated on balls. You'll see dogs stood next to their owners, not interacting. You'll see dogs just leaving. Like, um and then the owner complaining all the time, like, my dog doesn't interact. My dog uh, just plays fetch. He doesn't doesn't play with other dogs. Or my dog just doesn't want to be there. Well, yeah, that's fine. If your dog doesn't want to be there, don't be it's there. Telling, it's telling you something. Yeah. And even in puppy schools, I think um, a lot of uh, people that teach the puppy schools, you know, I think that aren't trainers necessarily or even you know, sometimes I guess they might be, but they put so much emphasis on play. Uh, rather than actually just being around a dog. And for me, a social dog is a dog that can read a situation and react appropriately. Yeah, and I think let's just touch back on the puppy school situation because there are a lot of puppy schools out there that just focus on play. Mm. And I've seen a lot of videos lately and it's actually quite scary because some of those dogs don't want to be there and the communication and body signals that they're showing... They're terrified. Yeah, just because a dog wants to play with another dog, it doesn't mean it's being social. Yeah. Because if he's, if the play between dogs and any interaction between dogs is a full-on conversation, it's a series of invites and back-offs. Yeah. And that dog that just presses its own agenda, I want to play or I want to be aggressive or I want to just go and sniff your butt, but isn't listening to the other dog, isn't being social. He's actually just not listening to the other individual. And... Social, a social animal can hold a conversation and react appropriately. And um, that old saying, and I'm bringing it up nice and early, is he's friendly. Don't worry. My dog's friendly. Get fucked. Get out of my space. I do not want a hug from a stranger. I don't want your dog in my dog's space. It's such a shitty... Like, he's friendly. Just shits me. I'm like, you're, I'm out of here. You're, you're, not, you're obviously not listening. The one that scares me the most is um, when the owner says to the dog, now be friendly. I'm like, okay, bye. Oh, yeah. That dog is... <laughs> I'm like, for one, that dog is, doesn't know what you're saying. You're just saying a heap of words to it. And two, if it's going to attack the other dog, it's it's going to do it. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing is, like all of these situations where we take our dog in and want them to play and everything, what we're really doing is making them hyper. And yeah. just like in people, hyper people 
aren't necessarily the most social people. Like they're, they're out there, they're involved. But just, like I say, just because you're involved doesn't mean you're actually being social. Yeah. You're not actually engaging in your environment and those within it very appropriately. Um, and I think a lot of us mistake hyperarousal for happiness. We, oh, definitely. We see we see yeah. the dog moving really fast and really, you know, just bolting into situations and um, not really... Re- I mean, if we actually look at it deeply, we're not, they're not really regarding the other individual, but, you know, he's just like, hey, he just wants to be involved. Oh, my God, he's so friendly. Yeah, he's, he's also uh, loose. Like, his brain is melting right now. Like, if this was a person, you'd ask him, you're right, mate? Yeah. You're going to calm doing? down? I refer to it, um, there's a trainer, uh, Glenn Cook, and he always calls it uh, lizard brain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I use it all the time. I'm like, yeah, so your dog has lizard brain. Yeah, <laughs> and they're like, oh, okay. Because what they're talking about is, um, and we've talked about it in the past, is that uh, danger brain and thinking brain. Um, I think um, we spoke about it in the past, very t- only briefly touched on it. But positive stress, as in hyper arousal and happiness, still releases the adrenaline, yeah. and it and it activates that side of your brain where you're acting reflexively and res- and you're not. It's not a thought out process. And we've all done it. I'm I'm probably the, I'm notorious for it. Just being a bit of an idiot when I'm hyper, um, <laughs> like this morning. <laughs> <laughs> like I'll go and make a snap decision in the moment, and then go, oh, <laughs> probably got that one a bit wrong. But at least I've got the ability to reflect on it. Whereas um, dogs are just, you know, they they don't reflect the same way we do. Yeah, their brain moves on so quickly. Yeah. I mean, let's look at a dog. Like, so say he's hyper aroused and we put him in a situation around another dog and we start this conversation off like hyper aroused dog going up to a complete stranger. And he's all of a sudden, he's not able to process what the other individual's saying. His brain is not reading information. And the other one, the other dog's going to start going, you're a bit weird, mate. You are a bit weird. You're a bit much. And they're going to start communicating, lip licking and like all of these fiddle signals where the other dog is just going, I really don't know why you're in my space. I don't know you and you're being hyper. Um, and it's going to, if eventually that dog's either going to leave or he's going to tell that dog off. Yeah. Unless, of course, the dog is, the dog, the hyper dog calms down. But this is where, again, I think a lot of people will go, hey, just let him sort it out. Just let him tell him off and he'll learn. But what that does is it creates a negative association, a nervous association of dogs. So next time he's that hyper dog who has been told off previously in the past for being hyper, he sees another dog, he's still hyper, he hasn't learned really how to calm down. What he's learned is nervousness. So now he's hyper and nervous and he goes in and he's, he's starting to get stressed while he's hyper. Displaying weird signals as well. Probably. Yeah. And then we see dogs offer play as a gesture. Play is a, a very social, like socially appeasing behavior in terms of it's a non-aggressive, I'm trying to make this go well. And of course the dog is trying to make it go well, but he's so, his lizard brain is on so hard <laughs> that he doesn't really know how to read the situation and he's still not being social. Yeah. If he was reading it appropriately, he'd go, oh, I'm sorry, mate, I didn't mean to push it that hard. Um, do you want to, I'm going to go over here. And he starts to listen. And the other dog then learns that this dog listens. And then you build curiosity because they're actually having a conversation where both of them feel heard. Yeah. I, th- I have said this for years where dogs build relationships through trust. And trust is earned through listening. And that's the only way you earn trust. And uh, that dog that doesn't listen to others is going to be... The, the other dog's going to learn that this dog is loose. I don't trust it. I don't like being around it. And I actually can't drop my guard around it. And of course, it's going to get negative feedback then from lots of dogs. And eventually, it's going to learn dogs are crap because dogs always give me bad feedback. Yeah. So letting our dogs go into these situations hyper sets them up poorly for the long run. Especially when there's like 20 dogs in the park as well. It's how can you listen to a conversation? It's like 20 people talking at once. Yeah. Actually, that's a really good point. I see this a lot where... People go in and they, they'll let their dog say hello to another dog. Um, and what they might do is pat their dog at the same time. Now, your dog is now having two conversations at once. It's getting patted. It doesn't know why. Um, it's got no concept of what the hell your hand is doing on its ass while it's saying hello to somebody else. Um, 
And it can't, like you and me, we can't hold two conversations at once. And all of a sudden it starts having a weird conversation with us and the dog. And I'll say, for example, another one where we introduce two dogs to one dog at once. And that dog is all of a sudden flooded and having two conversations at once. Yeah. It, it's, it's weird. It's hard. So we've got to make it a bit easier on our dogs and actually just remember as well, like they, they need to get to know each other before playing. Play is a result of deep friendship. Um, I mess around and, you know, play around with my best mates. Um, if you see me really playing around with somebody I've just met, probably because I'm nervous talking. <laughs> I probably like don't know what else to do. So I'm starting to fiddle. Yeah. And being a bit weird about it. And I'll probably sell an inappropriate joke. And um, <laughs> it'll either make people laugh or cry. <laughs> yeah, I think you have to relate it back to humans at a party. You know, if you go to a party and everyone's talking at once, it's a bit much. Um, and you might try and keep up with that. Yeah. But really, what you're trying to do is keep up with that. Yeah. It is a lot. And dogs have got the cognitive thinking ability of a what eighteen month old child, and they're not. They're gonna just their their lizard brain is just gonna fire real fast. How good is lizard I love brain? It. Well done. Yeah, you're gonna great. use it now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's why also puppy school is so important. I think everyone has this perception of puppy school um, to say, you know, oh, when are the dogs gonna play? When are the dogs gonna play? But once they come to both of our puppy schools, mm. the first class and the second class, they start to realize oh, shit, this is just not about play. There's no. so much more to it. And sometimes in puppy school, some dogs don't play together because yeah. they're not appropriate for each other. Yeah, like I don't like all people, so yeah. I don't interact with all people. Yeah, exactly. And always the first class, I always bring everyone in and I just get the dogs to settle and get them to feel comfortable in that environment. It's yeah. a new environment for them. There's a heap of strange people in there. There's a heap of... Well, not a heap, I should say. There's five dogs max. Mm, yeah, deliberately um, small classes. Yeah. yeah, and that's on purpose too. Um, but yeah, as I said, the second class people are like, I get why this is just not about play, 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 play. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's it. I mean, we even started a new puppy school recently with a new vet. Um, and even the vet, she's been at puppy schools and her vets for a long, long time. And she went, you guys don't let them play straight away. And we went, no, they they don't know each other so we bring them in we calm them down and then we do play at the end of the session yeah because dogs communicate through eye contact and body language and if they're hyper they don't pick up on those signals and every single dog in that class sitting two or three feet away from one another is having a conversation yeah they're signaling to one another and you gotta remember they don't know why they're there they've been dragged to a room that smells like you know a medical practice which can be quite stressful and then we're expecting them to interact now, I want them to interact normally and healthily and calmly and have a real conversation, not just run in a room, run around, play. Because, and, and we're not correcting these dogs at all. We're bringing them in and we're, we're creating positive associations. We're, we're not forcing them to stop by manually, you know, pinning them down or nothing like that. It's literally like bring them in calmly, you know, teach them how to relax the lead so that they're actually staying there on their own accord, use food rewards to hold their attention, create positive associations. And what we end up doing is bringing the arousal level of these of these puppies down to the point where they're going, well, this is great. Like, I can read all the humans. I can see their faces. I can see that their hands are dropping down and giving me food. I can see that dog over there is stressed, so I'm probably going to stay away from him. And we're teaching alternative behaviors other than play. I always uh, say my favorite dog in class is a dog that falls asleep. Yeah. <laughs> and everyone's yeah. like, What? And I was like, well, they've relaxed. They've let their guard down. They're like, oh, I can actually sleep here yeah. because I'm comfortable. And from an owner's perspective as well, like the owner takes their dog in and I've said this for a long time as well. Nobody calls us because they can't rev their dog up. Yeah. Like they all call us because they can't settle their dog down. So if we from day one go, hey, look, you're not going to have a problem revving your dog up. We're going to let them play at the end. But let's really concentrate on the hard stuff that you're going to be able to use in future life and practice wherever you go. This is how you settle a dog down. And that is a skill. That is, that is something that if people applied like calm first and then let them off when it's appropriate, then we don't end up chasing our shadow all the time. You know, say we get to a dog park or say we get to our friend's house and we go, 
hey, I'm going to just spend five minutes just settling you down. Then guess what? The rest of the day, the rest of the time in that park, the rest of the time in your friend's house, super easy. Yeah. Because you've got a baseline of calm. Whereas if you go, hey, this is going to be mental and let him <laughs> off the lead. Guess what? It's mental. Yeah. And the other important thing too is your walk starts from when you get the lead or when you put on your shoes or whatever your routine is. It starts in the head. At the, yeah. And at the house too. Yeah. As soon as the dog knows he's going for a walk, that's when you're going for a walk. And if you stack on all these stimulants... Want to go walkies? Let's go walkies. Where are you? Where are you get the lead out, open the door, <laughs> go out the gate, go down the street. Here's another dog. Hyper, 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 hyper. By the time yeah. he meets that dog, he's a bit of a loose unit. His lizard brain. <laughs> His lizard brain's on. <laughs> and you've got the weirdest conversation in the world. Yeah. And that's not going to set him up to be social. No. And that was your goal, to take him out and socialize him. Yeah. So uh, calm from the start, pretty much. That's what I said, everyone. Be calm from the start and then you're going to get a, a calm dog as you're walking absolutely and i think this is um you know this 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 recognition i think could change dogs dog ownership for the better in so many ways to the right down to when breeders are actually looking for dogs like are they breeding a calm dog or are they breeding a dog because it looks good because yeah no problem behaviors later on in life come from you know, of, co of course, like pain will affect behavior, but so many problem behaviors that we work with are derived from hyper arousal Definitely. Be because their brains just don't switch on it and combine breeding with ownership and you end up with, and we have, and we've got a culture of rev your dog up, tire it out, um, you know, hype your dog up so hard that it crashes and it's easy to own. Um, I find that that's a little bit backwards, to be honest. I, I've I've always said that, you know, you, if you make them comfortable and settled, then you don't need a tired dog. A tired dog's the same as a tired human. Shitty, unable to learn, grumpy, you know, not really social. Um, whereas if we make them comfortable, then they're able to have a conversation, they settle in their own skin. I think a big myth out there that I, I learned a couple of years ago is dogs don't really get bored that easily. They get very comfortable though, and they yeah. relax. But we have again. I think it's uh, derived by, driven by um, pet stores, to be honest, and marketing. If they can sell stimulating products, then um, they can make us feel guilty for not purchasing and keeping our dogs busy. Then we end up in this culture of what's the next thing I can give my dog? What's the next thing I can give my dog? What's the next thing I can hype my dog up with? And um, we end up with overtiredness and grumpiness and not being social and it, and in, i think we could be really focusing on um many other things like keeping that dog calm keeping them comfortable it improves the dog's life and the owner's life imagine that i said to you um say you had a big night and you're really tired and i was like hey let's go out you would be like no i'm so tired let me socialize alone. every day yeah you'd be like Get, go away we're going to sleep I'm ordering Uber Eats, okay? <laughs> yeah, take it easy. Like, um, Yeah, you don't have... People think you have to walk your dog every day. You have to take your dog to the dog park every single day. That's a big ask of anybody. It's stressful and it's just such, as you said, like this guilt. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's and that guilt is, is comes from your own voice in your head, what you've probably been brought up with as a culture. I should be doing this. And I think there aren't many shoulds. I think um, what we can be doing better is actually looking at the situation as in, how do I feel that day? Do I want to go out? That's okay if I don't. I'm going to give my dog some games in the house to play. Yeah, some training. I'm going to um, listen to my dog. Did he have a big day yesterday? Um, you know, does he, does he actually need to be hyped up today because he was mental yesterday? But again, it goes back down to education and, you know, uh, do I tire him out because he's hyper? Settle him down. Settle him down and make him comfortable. And you won't end up with these massive highs and massive lows. You end up with a normal animal. I, um, one of my clients actually uh, met up with another one of my clients, two little Dachshunds. And, um, the crazy, crazy Dachshund, <laughs> right here. That's <laughs> me. And the next day I was like, she's so tired. Like I took her out. She wanted to sleep in the park. So I just took her back in. I played some games. So I set her down, went to sleep. And then I said, next time these two play, 
no walk the next day. I'm mm. like, she does not need it. She is super tired. And the owner went, you're right. Yeah. Cool. No walk the next day. Easy. Let mm. him recover. Yeah. I think um, a lot of people struggle with the idea of not putting the dog in the social situation every day because they're scared that they're going to become antisocial. That's massive, yeah. isn't it? Like, um, and and even with a rehab client that I've got, say I've got an, an extreme aggression case or anything, I'll say, look, just strip it all back. Stop him interacting with dogs at the minute. He, at the moment, he hates dogs, right? Yeah. So if we strip it back and go, do you know what? Let's just give him a break from the things he hates. It's like you going on a holiday. You come back ready to take things on again. You've refreshed. You've reset your everything in your body, and you go, do you know what? I can, I can, I can get reintroduced now. I'm ready to take on a certain amount of stress. That doesn't mean you take him back in and flood him and go, here's a dog park, mate. I know you hate dogs, but with your puppy, you know, let him digest the information. Um, they're capable of REM sleep, which means they process information in their sleep. And as a puppy as well, I mean, side note, they only release growth horm hormone when they're asleep. Yeah. So sleep is essential for a dog. Um, dogs need to be, puppies need about 20 hours a day and adult dogs need to be asleep 18 hours a day, 75% of the day. Because they're processing so much information that they don't understand in this human world. And if we flood them with it, with hyper aroused every day, then um, we end up with a broken dog, literally a broken dog. The prolonged exposure to the adrenaline and cortisol that this brings literally damages the hippocampus in the brain. And this isn't this isn't this isn't a myth. This is science. Like, yeah. take for example, and this is where um, take for example ball play, right? Yeah, like. I love playing and fetch with my dog, but I make my dog communicate and we, we get him to stop, throw the ball, still show impulse control, see if he can do something else like come to me or lay down instead of fetch it because we've got a dog that loves the game, but his thinking brain's active. How many people do we see throw the ball because the dog barked at them or throw the ball and the dog can't not fetch it? The dog's not playing anymore. He's not actually in a social frame of mind whatsoever. He's in the reflexive lizard brain. There you go again. And he's actually firing his adrenal glands like off the charts. Yeah. And we get, and how many times do we see like border collies, kelpies, these working dogs, people have a mentality of, I've got to drain the energy. I've got to, I've got to tire them out. And so they throw the ball relentlessly for the first year of their life. Not well, more forever really, but for the first year of their life, they don't actually get to be social. Playing ball isn't a social activity. It's just focusing on a completely man-made thing. It's obsessive compulsive as well. Yeah. You start just obsessing over it. Yeah. And I like can't cope in the park without the ball anymore. Yeah. But after, after a year, after a year and a half of doing that, one, they don't have the social skills because they've never really communicated with a dog. They've only actually been around dogs, but never, but fetching a ball. It's like a guy, um, a guy, we were actually talking about this um, in England, the drinking culture, right? They'll go out and they'll get smashed, but when they're smashed, they can't have a conversation, right? So they might not be, they're like a really leery bunch, but yeah. they can't really have a conversation. So there's Border Collie in the park, for example, he spends the first year and a half of his life around dogs, but doesn't really know how to interact with them. But not only that, every day, even though he might have had the best time of his life in a way, like, you know, addicted to this ball, um, his adrenaline levels are firing, his cortisol levels are firing, and, he, and he's stressed, he's exhausted. And then you start to see tired, grumpy behaviours, and you start to see him get shitty with the dogs around him. How many Border Collies do you see in the dog park that are social, as in, like, actually interacting with dogs over the age of a year and a half? No. Because we normally drain them, smash them so hard that they're exhausted by that age. Yeah. And you, I do see a lot of times um, when you're at the park and people throwing the ball, throwing the ball, throwing the ball, throwing the ball till the dog actually like not collapses, but yeah, lies yeah. down and just goes, oh, I'm yeah. done. Yeah. And it's like. And then people still pick it up and go, hey, we've, we've got to, we've known, we might done. have to leave him alone tonight. So we'll, uh, we'll throw it even harder. We'll just throw it 10 more times. And like that is a half life for a dog. Well, my sister has a um, border collie. You've met Rose. Uh, border yeah, collie. Yeah. No, you don't. <laughs> Blue healer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Talking about border collies. Um, Rosie, you've met Rosie. Mm. And that's what happened to them. They would throw the ball, throw the ball, throw the ball. And she'd start bowling over dogs. Mm. 
And then I said, stop taking the ball to the park because she's not actually seeing the other dog. She's not actually coping in that situation. And they stopped taking the ball. And she was like, oh. So for the first sort of bit of the park, she didn't know how to cope. It took a long time for them to get her to be able to cope in the park. It's a social environment. And we need to create a social frame of mind for yeah. them to be able to interact with others there. Um I think as well, going sticking on working dogs for a minute, you know, everybody says drain the energy and so many people focus on physical energy, which involves that hype in the arousal level up. That border collie on the farm or the kelpie on the farm that runs around chasing everything that moves like your ball that you've thrown and not asked for any impulse control, it, get, it, it doesn't last long on the farm. It's not a very good working dog because it's not working. Working involves thinking. Working involves standing still and watching and showing impulse control much more than it does chasing. And so if, when, we're, when we're trying to tire our dogs out, rather than hyping them up, get them to think. Stay. Yeah. Staying still. Stay is, stay is my favorite game. Because staying still while things are going on around them is so much harder than moving after it. Yeah. And it drains so much more energy. Exactly like... Border Collies, just want to touch back on that. So my partner um, at their farm, they had a Border Collie and um, they uh, milking farm. So Border Collie, go get the cows twice a day. She'd be buggered. Mm -hmm. Then um, they cut down the cows. So there was less cows. So she had less work to do. Mm -hmm. And then she started going to the cat. She'd sit at the cat, watch the cat, wait, sit at the cat. The cat would leave. She'd go to the goat, go to the goat sit to the goat, watch the goat. It was just like, because she wasn't doing her job anymore. Yeah. Didn't actually have um, the life skills or coping skills to be able to do anything but try and make things move. Yeah. Very um, abnormal dog, really. I think when you do get a dog, you have to think what they were bred for as well. I think mm. a lot of people, my first question is, why, why did you pick that breed? Mm. Oh, they're cute. I'm like, do you know why they were bred? Do you know why they're trying <laughs> to move you around? This from the crazy around? dash and lean. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do you know why they're trying to herd you? Do you know why they're trying to Why they bark you? when they see things? Why they do this? Why... Yeah. yeah. These are inherent behaviors that we need to cater for because they're not just going to go away. These are genetically ingrained behaviors. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, let's go back to um, actually coming to arrive at the park. Yeah. So, a lot of people, sometimes you see their dog, like, pulling at the lead, like, oh, I'm, do I'm doing these actions that you can't see. <laughs> <laughs> I'm swimming across the table right now. <laughs> you know, pulling at the lead, at the end of the lead, like, choking themselves to get to the park. They're already in that mind frame, and they're already hyper. Yeah. Um, they probably shouldn't be there in that situation that's so right uh, taking them calmly to the park i'm gonna just go to side sidebar off that and this is again perception i think people say yeah but he wants to do it He's like excited. he wants to fetch the ball he yeah. wants to go and see his friends what i ask people at that point is is he thinking or is he acting reflexively can yeah. you actually if you took the lead off and if or if, if you throw the ball can you actually verbally say to him hey wait a minute like wait stay stop yeah. Because true. if your dog can't hear you and complete the behavior, he's not thinking. And so you're about to introduce a dog that isn't thinking to another dog. How is that going to go well? No. It's fucked. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that all stems back from when you leave the house. Mm -hmm. Leaving calmly, arriving calmly to the park, getting your dog to... This is the one thing that I don't see a lot. Getting your dog to sit, chill for a second... Then be able to take off the lead. Take a moment. Yeah. You see them like pulling, 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 release the lead. You've actually reinforced that pulling behavior. He is a boomerang. He's not. He's a bow and arrow, <laughs> not a boomerang. boomerang. He's not going to come back. He's not coming back. That's not, <laughs> <laughs> fuck that one, didn't I? He is not coming back. He is not a he's boomerang. not a boomerang. No. He is <laughs> it's going to be the tag. You are literally just firing a dart into the crowd and hoping it doesn't punch someone. That's the thing. Hoping it comes back. Yeah. Yeah, and this is where, when we've got puppies, and the truth is that this happens. This happens every day. But if we can get through to a few people that when they get their dog, they, they're aware of this, and when they get to a park, they can take their time. Hopefully, we can start to make this normal. Because 
even yesterday I was walking down the street and um, their dogs, this dog was off lead and walking down the uh, road off lead, started trying to play with my dog. I was like, oh, you know, sorry, mate, not really the most appropriate time to play. And he's like, oh, you know, dogs will be dogs. I'm like, no, this is your responsibility. You're on a footpath next to the main road in Bondi. Put your dog on the lead. Don't let him be a goose. Let you get to make a decision for your dog in the human world. Don't Dogs will be dogs, absolutely. But that's why you're there to actually guide them and look after them. Your dog will be flattened by a car because you're on a main road. You muppet. <laughs> like, what the hell? Yeah. Like, I, I'm all for it. Dogs will be dogs, but there's a time and place. education, though. Yeah. Well, and, and, yeah, I think, you know, that just shits me a little bit. Like, be a little bit more responsible than that. Like, so, say my dog didn't even want to play. Like, yeah. Say you just say my dog barked at him for coming up in the space and scared that dog into the road. That would be your fault, wouldn't it? Yeah. Well, my dog, my aggressive dog. Then. Yeah. Yeah. Which is not fair. No. Because you're doing the right thing. That's and it. And it's not. Actually, yeah. Like, let's go back onto like on the leash and like just that letting your dog approach every other dog and like going, oh, you know, I'm just socializing him. You're make say I've got a, a dog that doesn't like other dogs that much I mean, he doesn't go after dogs but say he just like bit doesn't really like them in his space and you're walking down the road and you go hey i'm just gonna like let him approach like my dog will probably tell your dog off yeah that's not inappropriate you're the one being inappropriate you're in my space it's like me going down the street and hugging every bloody stranger i see i'm gonna get some bad feedback <laughs> somebody is gonna go Bomb. what are you doing mate <laughs> And if that happens over the time, people will go, oh, you know, people are idiots. People are assholes. They never want hugs. No. Just be normal. Like, give them a bit of space. It's, like, it's just, I don't, want, I don't want to hug off every stranger in the street and I don't expect my dog to want the same. Yeah. So, yeah. probably wrap that up for today. I think that's pretty much everything uh, we went through. Absolutely. So, thanks for listening, everybody. Um, don't forget, send us your feedback as to what you've heard today did you learn something do you want some more advice um let us know we're always happy to hear hear from you 